Okay, let's get right back to it. And we're going over to somewhere in Asia. Talk to our colleague and friend, Yochi Shimatsu, who has been with us for, well, quite a long time now, almost since this whole thing began. Are you there, Yochi? Yeah, well, there happens to be Bangkok just got in, uh, out of uh, Fukushima, out of Japan. Uh, how, how's it, how does it feel? How does it feel? How does it feel to how does it feel to have left Japan this time? Well, actually, it left me quite exhausted. You know, this uh, whole uh, you know, besides all the exercise of walking around every day, you know, uh, 15, 20, 25 kilometers a day out there, and very 90 degree heat. You know, there's been a heat wave out there, and that has that's not uh, isolated from what's been happening in Fukushima. The releases from there. Uh, and uh, just generally feeling that uh, you're coming down from feeling like your body's been microwave, that you're being cooked from the inside out. So, uh, you know, it'll be good to detox for a while to uh, try to shake that woozy feeling that uh, overcomes you after a while. You know, you can resist it for a while, but inevitably it starts to drag you down. So it's good to be out. But, um, you know, last week was uh, I was hoping we could connect. At the time, I was sitting in a area, a, vi a former village that had been wiped out by the tsunami, and I had purposely walked inland a bit to be near rail rail line, uh, where we know there's mobile service. Uh, yeah. There were two towers in sight and all that, and no call comes through. Uh -huh. And uh, this is not unusual. I've been further into the interior a week earlier, expected a call from a friend in Europe. That didn't come through. So whenever I'm near the Fukushima zone, and I, I mean not just the exclusion zone, not just that 20 kilometer zone, but a vast strategic area, so the Los Alamos of Japan, mm -hmm. stretching from the sea coast into the deep interior mountains, uh, no phone service deliberately. Although at least, at least not, not, yeah, not, not for, it, not for you, that's the point. Yeah, yeah and the uh, mobile phone service couldn't figure it out either, how or why they did it, why we know why they did it. And, yeah. Uh, but basically, um, what we're seeing is that, you know, there's a 10-kilometer space between Fukushima 1 and 2. Uh, former village of Tomioka is there. It's probably going to be used as a nuclear dump site, given the amount of very hot material they're coming with, up with. And then uh, this whole zone stretches interior to way outside the exclusion zone. And uh, locals have uh, told me about, you know, and this has been going on for decades, uh, people don't like to go to the mountains because suddenly you make a wrong turn and a bunch of guys come out, they accost you, turn you back without explanation, and uh, if you try to press on, they'll threaten you and so on uh, with detention and all that. So many, many secret sites out there. And um, in that whole yeah, to me in the town, yeah. of, town of Girona where uh, the secret police had uh, waylaid me there. You know, uh, In fact, uh, uh, the day before that your call was supposed to come in. Huh. Uh, all right. The idea that Japan has not been significantly harmed by the radiation from Fukushima is one that yeah. a number of Japanese still hold, uh, unfortunately. Now, there are large demonstrations, we know that. But the denial yeah. factor is still uh, present and, and certainly significant. It's not gone away as fast as we'd like it to see. One man was tested in, in Fukushima, in the, in the area of Fukushima, yeah. I think Fukushima City, and he came up with 20,000 becquerels in his body. Um, yeah, yeah, that's not surprised. That's not, not good. Surprised. Now, how much yeah. of Honshu, in your estimation, has been significantly, well, substantially Well, it's, it's not my hurt? estimate. In fact, on this last trip, I had traveled throughout the island to the very southernmost part of the mainland, the very tip of the mainland. Uh, down in Kyushu in the southern point. Uh, well, first, uh, you know, I mean, obviously the Fukushima area, there's places that have been sanitized uh, by work crews, but other hot spots, for example, town of uh, Hirono right there on uh, the border of Fukushima, too, right near Jay Village where all the workers are staying, this former sports, soccer, and basketball complex where there's all the worker uh, uh, prefab housing, you know, that little trailer park sort of. Right. Uh, it was not so little, thousands of people staying there as well, outdoor toilets. And, uh, very primitive, I, I thought. I was very surprised that they couldn't do better. And there's a lot of contractor villages. Anyway, the, there's the southern gate of Fukushima 2. I measured a 0 0.78, nearly one, nearly one millisievert right there on that spot, which sort of belied their comments that uh, all the radiation came from Fukushima 1. That could not have been possible 
to have a site like this. I walked around with his old resident whose house had been destroyed by the earthquake. He told me, well, this is the uh, point forty-eight corner. Everyone calls it the 48 microceiver corner, okay? Then uh, as I was leaving town, this is after, you know, the, some secret police guy jumped out of a car, accosted me, asked me what I was doing there, if I was doing interviews, and, you know, my immediate response would have been had I been more younger and more naive with it, who the hell are you to ask? But my answer to him was, well, what interviews? There's nobody here to interview. This is a ghost town. Either yeah, everyone yeah. is left <laughs> or they're dead, okay? Right. And uh, he says, well, if you want, you know, uh, he says, then what are you doing, Kenya? Well, I'm taking a picture of this roadside statue of a Buddha. It is very interesting. That sort of threw him off. And he said, next time, he says, if you want to do interviews, you got to go to the city hall, uh, city hall, register there, and bring your ID along. And I said, well, that's very good. That means next time I come here, I'll know what to do. I'll just go exactly straight to the town hall so I can do my interviews. He says, what do you mean? You're coming back. I said, well, thanks to you, I know what to do now. I'm going to come back and do some interviews. Thank you. Huh. Well, you uh -huh. left after that very flustered. Uh -huh. uh -huh. But, um, but uh, you know, on the town, I was the only guy walking around this whole area. You know, the town is going to the two. I was the only person out and walking around. No one else dares walk outside there. Hmm. And then so they make this PA address, public address, I guess just for me, saying, well, we've just registered this morning. We've done measurements, 0.24 uh, micro you know, uh, there's 24 micro essentially. And then, uh, I said, oh, that's very funny, because right here where I'm standing, it's, uh, 34, it's 10 points above. So, obviously the government's un underplaying the effort. What, uh, to make a long story short, I checked the mountain just northwest of Tokyo, okay, where some of the water into Tokyo comes in. Yes. Uh, yes. there was a high pressure zone, which from the Pacific had been pushing moisture from the Pacific Trench over Japan into Korea, uh, China, and so on. And uh, on a uh, saddle between two feet, and this is at 1,000 meters high, 1,100 meters high, 2,000 feet, and a little more than 300 feet high, I got registers of uh, uh, 28 microceivers up to about uh, 40 microceivers, which is unheard of, just you know, moisture in the air. So it's come drifting in over the Pacific, and in the far distance you can see those illuminated clouds that I talked about you know, drifting in from the Pacific uh, Trench. So this the moisture, this, tip this, this of, mo uh, Kyushu, uh -huh. uh, high uh -huh. readings also, uh, okay. higher up about 1,200 meters, uh, bottom of the cloud, uh, I was getting something like point twenty eight. That's very, very far from the Trench, very far south of Fukushima, still a lot of radiation atmospheric. And this accounts for all the deaths there from the so-called heat waves. These are heart attacks. These aren't heat caused deaths. These are heart attacks from the radiation that's washing in. Now, this this moisture is coming from the water the off, off eastern the the trench, trench, off eastern off, Japan. Off, that's where correct. Where a lot of the solid material that came that they dumped out of Fukushima uh -huh. and that was washed away by the tsunami settles down in the trench, concentrates there, and that's where clouds form. And, the, and you can see it on the horizon. Sort of this sort of dirty gray spot, and then when the you know it gets very excited at times, these very colorful clouds arise. These very tall, and then uh, you know generally they're blowing toward the United States, but uh, whenever there's a Pacific high, they'll come into Japan. I was there when there was a Pacific high typhoon, and the typhoon really drove it into southern uh, Japan, South Korea, in fact, right into China, into the Beijing area. So you know there was a lot of radiation in typhoon number fifteen uh, forced in. I also stopped in Taipei, Taiwan, northern part of Taiwan. Uh, not too high the readings there because a different typhoon had come from the south and cleared the air. But uh, in the flight in between, there was massive radiation, you know, in uh, you know, 30,000 foot range where the thing was flying. Yeah. There is, uh, uh, even uh, in the Sea of Japan, uh, the waters are, are showing uh, much higher radiation than, than is normal. Yeah, yeah, that's a condensation. It's a cooler area than the Pacific, so condensation occurs there, mm -hmm. dropping down. So basically all the seafood in uh, Korea is is, uh, is not too good. And speaking of the seafood, you know, the fishermen there told me readings off of uh, south of the plants there. They've been pole, pole fishing, sending samples to the lab. Uh, bottom feeders heavily irradiated. Uh, one type of uh, rockfish was registering 1,700 decibels, and uh, 
the study was somewhat flawed because they didn't have to have the weight or estimate the age of the fish. I mean, there's a lot of things that you would have to input, flesh versus bone versus skin and all that. Uh, but in the case that the area still remains quite hot, that a lot of fish are irradiated. In fact, all the fish are irradiated, just a matter of degree of what you consider a safe level. There. Right. The, the debate, uh, uh, is, yeah. The de yeah, the debate continues. Now, there are, there are of course, uh, still uh, reports of massive amounts of radioactive hot water being dumped. Uh, I guess TEPCO admitted to a thousand tons a day being dumped into the Pacific yeah, yeah, continually, it's, it's, but that's the admitted that's level. That, yeah. Now the idea of fish. I talked to a uh, middle ahead. manager that was one of the general contractors. He says there are many, he says many, many sites there, uh, uh, one millisievert sites, especially turbine rooms, and they're just digging these things out, stuffing all the metal, uh, the pipes, the dirt, you know, the gravel, concrete, and it's a 40-foot container size casket because they have nowhere to go with these things. So they're just stacking them up, you know, they're just because it's, you know, And these are all one millisievert? You're, you're the, the annual no, dose one, is supposed no, one to be... Sievert. One sievert. You stand okay. to that site for five hours. One sievert. There. I got gotcha. you. I didn't yeah, think it was one millisievert. It's 400 right. millisievert and one sievert, okay? The 400 stuff is the less than that. I mean, you stand next to that stuff, you know, for uh, uh, half a day, you're dead. You know? so, yeah, very toxic study. We have many, many sites, two kept secret. they got to wash them down so, you know, people can work near there. And then they're just calling, he says, uh, you know, it's incredible. He says, the amount of radiation there is incredible, that uh, the workers who are there, very much brutalized, uh, they show any sign of illness, they're immediately fired, kicked out of the area, sent home. Uh, you know, within a week or so, they run out of money. A lot of them are committed suicide. Uh, most of the workers are from Okinawa. The former coloni uh, colonial areas of Japan, the frontier, sort of like the Wild West of Japan, Okinawa and Hokkaido, where you know, there's still a lot of poor people. Uh, usually these guys work on um, cleaning up oil tankers. Mm -hmm. So they use the toxic work, but they're surprised when they get to Fukushima and find out their teeth are falling out and so on. Also, many workers from Niigata from the 2007 earthquake out there who had worked on uh, uh, patching up the uh, TEPCO reactor out there, uh, they come into so those three areas. There's well, not too many locals okay. who work there because the locals are very, very familiar with the radioactivity and know that it's deadly. Uh, is you is see the blue uh, bags all over the in Hirono town, which is kind of a Potemkin village now, uh -huh. which they're trying to uh, tear down all the earthquake torn buildings, older buildings. And you write new, brand new buildings they're erecting there. It's a real Potemkin village. There's so, so called decontamination going on. And trash is handled in two ways. Uh, some of the stuff that goes on open dump trucks, those are buildings that are not contaminated. But when you see these huge blue bags, uh, flat bags covered with blue tarps, I took reading of one of them. That was, uh, uh, point, you know, that was basically 60 millisieverts, uh, 60 microsieverts, so highly radioactive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Just sitting there on the corner waiting to pick up. How about so, the the Jet uh, Yochi? Massive, uh, the, massive amount of radiation everywhere. Yeah. Okay, the the general food supply for Japanese people now. How compromised yeah. is it, in your opinion? What are you reading? What are you hearing from others over there, scientists? Now we've seen another another story just the other day from a Japanese professor of nuclear engineering. Uh, they're coming forward and talking about the penetration of the food supply. It's coming up in the rice. It's coming up in the in the fruit crops. Yeah. It's coming up, of course, obviously yeah. in the fish that are caught. Tell me more about it. Yeah. Well, the problem is, is that you know the government's going with a low reading and using that as a general reading. Uh, that you know, there's a whole scale of like in fish, for example, there's a whole range of fish and what types of water, uh, what's their migratory pattern, what do they feed on. All that data is yet to be done. The fishermen are the only ones doing it. The government's not really doing much uh, with the data. There's no attempt to really analyze what it means, what parts of the fish, and how can, uh, you know, uh, how can some, maybe some fish be caught before they reach some of these radioactive feedings. All that stuff needs to be done. It's not being done. Rice, the farmers get around by just polishing it down more. So you see smaller rice in Japan. Is that the it? They, they, I, oh, they, that's interesting. So they polish the rice down to a smaller kernel yeah. size, and they get a they get a yeah. better reading on it. How interesting! Rice, the farmers get around by just polishing it down more, so you see smaller rice in Japan. Is the that it? They, they, I, oh, they, that's interesting. So they polish the rice down to a smaller kernel yeah. size, 
and they get a they get a yeah. better reading on it. How interesting! That's the that's the way. What they're doing with the scrap rice, who knows? A lot of Chinese tourists, and now they're trying to attract tourists from Malaysia, Muslim, uh, consuming a lot of this dangerous material. So they figured, well, the government figures they got to dump it and sell it to somebody, all this food, and then these guys would be here for only a week or two, so just let them gorge on this radioactive food. And then, uh, unfortunately, the attitude of the Chinese is that their food supply is so contaminated. Uh, what's the problem of going to Japan? It couldn't be any worse. So wow. the bad news for them, it is worse. And, uh, wow. Yeah. You know, uh, so, the, you know, super low prices are being offered to them on these super low tours. So uh -huh. it's kind of a very inhumane, cruel thing to do. Uh, it is. To reel in people who've been so isolated and come from a country mm -hmm. that has food safety problems and then to dump all your radioactive food on them. It's like something very horrific. I mean, it's something very yeah. inhumane. Going on. Speak if you can so a little fact, closer. Talk talk a, it's kind of an act of war. It's an act of war. If anything, well, yeah. it's, it is. It's talk a, a little louder into the. On, yeah. Talk a little louder in the phone, Yochi. Just a bit, if you can. Oh, okay. There we go. All right. Yeah, we have a bad. Yeah, it's always a bad line. Here, so. It's it's fair. Okay. It's okay. Um, All right. The the efforts of the average Japanese to get a real, honest reading on the danger they face are hampered the same way we are over here, by a government that is not going yeah. to tell them. And what they're, no. they're relying on are independents and various people from the academic community who have come forward, who are trying yeah. to do honest readings and spread the word. But there is, as I talked to uh, Richard Wilcox a couple of months ago, yeah. uh, he's living over there with a the family, been on the program a number of times, and I asked him, Richard, how many people in Japan really understand what's going on in terms of the environmental damage, the toxicity in the food, mm -hmm. land, air, water, and everything, they said about 1%. That's all that know. He said they really don't know. Yeah, now that, yeah, they may no, be conservative I mean, on that. Fear. There's a lot of fear. But so they don't want to know. That's right. Yeah, That's they don't have any real... Well, we would do the same here. People are people. Yeah. Well, I think in the United States, I understand when I was in Milwaukee, the, sort of the headquarters for all the work at Fukushima 1 and 2, there were a lot of workers, American workers from GE there on the street. You know, a lot of bars there they do a lot of drinking to take their mind off the problems of being contaminated. But apparently, I saw some people who look like DOE, government people there, Americans. So Americans are neck deep in this, and what they're neck deep in is Japan's nuclear program. America, the George Bush administration, perhaps even before that, they've been supporting Japan's nuclear bomb program. And these sites that we're talking about, it goes back many, many decades to uh, hydro plants like the ones in Norway. You have to understand that Fukushima, uh, a lot of the mountains there are created by uplift. So it's the only part of Japan with uranium. And uh, if you build dams there, if there are lakes there, the water will uh, become irradiated and it will create tritium. Tritium is uh, like deuterium. It's uh, basically water uh, uh, without, would have uh, two, two neutrons and it's very necessary to make uh, hydrogen bombs uh, to explode plutonium and make uranium uh, bombs explode more efficiently. And so this uh, plutonium, I mean, a uh, tritium extraction process has been going on there a long time. There's no way that the American government uh, could not have noticed that. In fact, probably supported it all along. And this is, uh, explains all these strange uh, quasi-nuclear, they, they were the strange new nuclear reactions we saw at Fukushima, the explosions, remember all the scary sort of bluish lights and flashes? Well, when tritium goes up like that, it'll be, uh, you know, the, the meltdowns will trigger the neutron bombardment of tritium. It will then release neutrons, but it will also split the water molecule into uh, 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 into uh, supercharged uh, isotopes, which then will recombine and then will release, basically creates a very strong electromagnetic field and electrical field which will then cause a lot of this sort of lightning, these flashes of light. So uh, tritium is sort of the missing element, which explains the nature of the explosions that we saw. They're not hydrogen explosions. These are tritium-enabled uh, explosions in the steam out of the reactors. So they're not doing that with the dams now, I don't believe, because you can make it nuclear reactors. But obviously, reactor 3 probably was used in tritium production also. So this is a part of the missing puzzle. And why the American people and the Japanese people do not know what's going on, it's all about weapons production. Illegal, uh, 
if it ever really comes out and the either government really admits to it at the end of the uh, the, end, the non-proliferation treaty, at the end of the U.S. Japan Security Treaty, basically nullifies all the treaties, uh, and uh, basically it'll, it'll make shambles of America's effort to rein in Iran, North Korea's nuclear programs, also. And there is a massive double standard here. When we have a massive site this large, this extensive, operated this long with American technicians and engineers over there, American support over there, it's going to be very, very tough for the United States to point the pointing fingers at uh, Iran or North Korea. It's a much smaller program. We have, uh, unfortunately, uh, a mm -hmm. curve that is going the wrong way. The accumulation of radioactive isotopes, again, in the ground and mm -hmm. the water and mm -hmm. the fish and the mm -hmm. animals, is not stopping. It's only increasing and it's going to continue that way. There's just no reversing it. We even have now yes. found increased levels. Now, these are small. They're not dangerous, but they're increased levels in pine needles all up and down the West Coast. Certainly in crops, yes, they right. found increased levels in prunes recently. The food supply here has been clearly impacted. Is it dangerous to eat? Not yet, but uh, things are only going to continue to compound and get worse. It is said within the next three to four years, the waters off the coast here are going to be heavily contaminated with the cesium yeah. twins and other heavy isotopes. So it's it's not a good situation, and we're just not getting anything at all from the government here. Nothing. No reading, no, no programs. Well, the no real, real threat in the upper atmosphere, we talked about these strange uh, weather that's happened in the United States this year. Uh, now a massive drought, it's, as I told you, as I flew over, massive amount of contamination in the upper atmosphere, changing weather patterns. We may see a lot of the United States, turn, North America, turn into a desert. We may see the depopulation of Scandinavia, where there's basically no more water left. This is this is causing massively, you know, massive things going on. It will only have happened. These levels will only have had if uh, weapons grade uranium were involved. The bomb has backfired, and I think on the anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombing, the chickens are coming home to roost in the United States of America. So far to date, Japan has dropped 168, at least, Hiroshima-grade bombs on itself with this disaster. Yeah, and it's all drifting across the Pacific in both directions. Yoshi, thank you for being here. Talk to you next week. Uh -huh. Be well. Detox and enjoy. All right. Okay. Okay, good night. Yoshi Shimatsu in Bangkok, Thailand, trying to detox from his time in the Fukushima area in Japan again. Uh, one of the world's most accomplished environmental reporters. Uh, remarkable to have him on the program each week. Do your research, do your studying, stay informed. Uh, we'll do our best to help as we can. Good night. Talk to you tomorrow.